My name's Driver Pheasant. I'm a Cherokee Indian with the Eastern Band of Cherokees. This is what the old men told me when I was a boy. A long time ago, all the animals lived up in Galun Ladi, which is heaven. And it was getting much crowded, and they were wanting more room. As they looked down, they saw the soft, flat earth, and they wondered what was down there, so they sent out different types of birds. Then one day, Shuli Egwa, he's the great buzzard, the grandfather of all the buzzards that we see now. He said he would go. He flew all around the world. After a while, he became tired, and he flew low down close to the earth. When his wings came down, they formed a valley. And when his wings came up, there was a mountain formed. And to this day, Cherokee country remains full of mountains. The people followed trails of the buffalo and deer. They fished the streams and ate wild berries and established small villages. The old Cherokees called Cataluchi Gadalutsi, which means standing in rows or ranks and referred to the trees along the mountain ridges. But in the late 18th century, the ways of the Cherokees changed completely and permanently as white settlers pushed ever westward. In the beginning, a few hunters, trappers, and fishermen built cabins in the area. Then Colonel Robert Love purchased the valley for $3,000 and granted homesteads to those who would settle the land. The development prospered, and the white settlers, stuttering over the Cherokee syllables, called it Cataluchi. I grew up in the Cataluchi Valley. It's in the center of the world. The reason I know that, you have to look straight up to see the sun. Each year, Catalucci families reunite. They come together in laughter, in song, and in fellowship. They reminisce over pictures which evoke fond memories of an earlier time. Palmers, Woodies, Hannahs, Suttons, Messers, Nolans and Caldwells, families who put down roots in the rich bottomlands along Cataloochee Creek. Well, my great granddaddy purchased some land in there in 1830. He was one of the first settlers, Levi Caldwell, and his wife Mary Nalen. And they raised a family of 11 children. They come in there in 1835, 1836. Small log homes dotted the slopes. The first built by Levi Caldwell in the mid-1830s. Sixty years later, Hiram Caldwell replaced the log house with a modern weatherboard structure. In the 20th century, the home became a welcome haven for tourists and renters. George Palmer came to Catalucci about 1840. His sons, Lafayette and Jesse, each built a classic dog trot house. The covered breezeway, or dog trot, ran between two log cabins, one of which was used for cooking and eating, the other for sitting and sleeping. The women peeled apples or potatoes in the cool breezeway on hot summer days. The family dogs also used the area to keep warm in winter and cool in summer, thus the name dog trot. George's grandson, Jarvis, was the last Palmer to occupy the house. He enlarged it, added three bunk houses, and visitors paid to fish in the three miles of streams he stocked. Flora Arlie Messer Morrow. I was born in Little Catalucci, November the 5th, 1895. Ten sisters and one brother. My father and mother were working people. They liked to have things and do things. My father was jack of all trades. He made about every casket that Catalucci needed. 
Little Catalucci was separated from Big Catalucci by Nolan Mountain, but the two were joined by blood and marriage as young adults moved across the mountain to establish their own homes. By 1910, there were 1,251 people in both Catalucci's. Like most early settlers, they became nearly self-sufficient. My mother made our clothes out of the men's old pants. This should take the legs and make the clothes. So this one is me and some of my pants. This is a brother. Mother made his clothes too. They're very obviously homemade. Uh, I'd like to tell you about the shoes. They were a high top moccasin, I suppose you would call them. And my mother made them from my father's old felt hats. She made her own pattern and uh, they were last surprisingly a long time. We all took our first steps in the shoes like that. And then if someone older than us had another pair of shoes they had outgrown, then we got real shoes and not felt hat shoes. The people of Catalucci also grew their own crops for food and ranged cattle in the mountains. Farming was done primitive. Of course, in my time, we had horses and turning plows. And I was probably plowing when I was 13 year old. They'd grow wheat. And of course, they had their corn. Corn was a stable food for making meal and bread. Jesse Palmer built the mill about 18. Oh, eight, in the mid-1850s. Of course, everybody come to mill on Saturday, you know, they brought their corn, and Saturday was regular mill day. Of course, they ground any other time that they need to be. Catalucians kept up with current events through national newspapers received at the Nelly Post Office. The combination store and post office provided a necessary tie to the outside world. Gudger Palmer remembers, let me just tell you a little bit about the uh, post office. When my father was postmaster, and however, my mother tended to the store and to the post office most of the time. And she would go down about 8 o'clock and fix up the mail. The women just about ran things. They did an awful lot of work. Now, my mother never worked in the hay field or the corn field. But uh, she did do some work in the garden. She cooked all the meals. And uh, when there's any special thing doing, like um, when we was killing hogs, why, she worked at that. She made the beds, swept the floors, scoured the floors by hand. We had a good time. Uh, we were raised up in a Christian home, but my father, uh, he liked good, clean farm. We had bean stringings and corn shuckings, and we'd have corn shellings. Schools were built in both Little Catalucci and Big Catalucci. Went to school up here at the school, which is still standing. When I started, we had two rooms, but when I wound up, we had this one room, one teacher. Flora Messer Morrow taught in Little Catalucci for a salary of $50 a month. I never had much trouble teaching. I had a lot of fun. We had uh, the blackboard, mostly, and uh, then I had the children to take their books home, and they had to recite and tell me all about that lesson the next morning at school. Each grade, she'd call up the front, go over your lesson at the front. That group would go back, and the next grade come cold. up. Cold, cold, C-O-L-D, cold. And always cold. on Friday, we had a spelling cold. match. Cold. The whole school participated. Right, sun. Sun, C-U-N, sun. Sun. The sun's shining today. Sun, S-U-N, sun. Trap, she said C-U-N, didn't she? Go ahead, Abba. Okay. Fade. School was in session for only five or six months each year. Next, fade. As the children were needed for harvesting and molasses making. Fade.
Church services were held once a month when the circuit rider came. Sunday school was in session every week. And each fall, the sounds of preaching, prayer, and the songs of revival filled the Palmer Chapel. And there was two things. There was always a must at our house. And that was when Amos and Andy come on, you had to be quiet. <laughs> and on Sunday morning come, you had to go to church. You had to go to church. That was two things that was a must. Church, family, and hard work. These were the foundations for building a prosperous community. I'd have to say by growing up in Catalucci and being as independent as our families were in there, and the rugged life that we had to live and hard work that we had to do to make a living probably helped me when I come out to be able to make a decent living without much education. In the early 1930s, the citizens of North Carolina and Tennessee entrusted this valley and its history to be preserved for future generations. As the Great Smoky Mountains National Park was created, families moved away, leaving behind vacant buildings and land no longer grazed nor plowed. But as we reflect on those who came before, sights and sounds of an earlier time echo through this valley. The Cherokee, the settlers, those who entrusted their hopes, their dreams, and often their lives to this place. They have not left us an empty valley, but one filled with vivid reminders of a heritage now bonded to the future.